Welcome once again to the Upper Room, and again, glad to be with you. Part two of this lesson from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, from the series called The Lucky Ones. And uh, just to pick up where we left off, uh, we will do that in a moment and get back to Matthew chapter 5. I want to start with a discussion question, however, and I'd like you to discuss amongst yourselves, what is the riskiest thing you've ever done? It's not easy, is it, to qualify what is the riskiest thing. Some things seem risky at the time, and then you look back and go, that wasn't really that risky. Some things you don't think are going to be risky, and they end up being very risky in the end. One of them that comes to mind for me is when our son Caleb was very young, maybe six or seven years old, and a friend of mine who was a captain in the fire department in Tucson said, I've got a friend who is the one who trains highway patrolmen how to drive. He has this track out here where he trains them, and, and he knew how much Caleb loved, was fascinated with fire engines, fire trucks, police cars. He said, would Caleb like to do this? It was kind of a spontaneous thing, so I didn't say anything to Christy about this. And so I said, sure! So we jump in the car. Of course, they put us both in the front seat, so we have to double buckle, because they don't have you know more than two buckles in the front seat. And this guy begins to do the things that he would do in training somebody how to drive at high speeds, do you know, strange things that need to be done in these chases. And at one point he was going 90 miles an hour and he looked at Caleb and he said, do you want to go faster? And I was, I almost said, no. And Caleb said, yeah. And he got up to like 110. And while we're doing this, he did all the, the spins, you know, the 180s and all those kinds of things. And my thought was this, if I don't die, if we don't die in this process, I will die when I get home and tell my wife what I just did with Caleb. <laughs> it turned out to be not that risky of a thing because nothing happened. But in the moment I thought this may be one of the riskiest things I've ever done. Not, you know, going 120 miles an hour or whatever, but not telling my wife that I took her son in, in this cop car to do this kind of thing. Risky things. I want you to think about risky things because we'll end that way later on. But keep that in mind. Okay. In our last lesson, we read Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 32, pretty much. And we talked about this idea that even though Jesus says, do not commit adultery, you've heard that said, I'm telling you, people who follow me, people who live in my kingdom, have a higher calling. It goes deeper, right? It's not that we're better than other people, we just have a different life that we live. And it isn't a life where we wait until adultery is at our door and then try to make a decision. We plan ahead, we look for harbingers, and one of the harbingers of adultery, and thus divorce most often, is lust and Jesus brings that up and so he said so that is marriage and then I warned you there's more than one kind of marriage and we talked about what I call junk marriage again there's actually a part of me that kind of hopes you're offended by that <laughs> somebody has you're saying some people have junk marriages yeah if your marriage is built on conventional wisdom of this culture convenience you getting happiness you getting what you want out of your marriage and if it ends in divorce, it ends in divorce, but you get what you want. That's a junk marriage. That is not what Jesus had in mind. So the question now remains that we need to look at is what did Jesus have in mind when he spoke of marriage? So in the first lesson, I didn't tell you where we were. We're at the Nicholas, Augie Nicholas, there are a couple, the Augie Nicholas feedlot, all right? We have, a, we have a real great appreciation for Augie Nicholas and his feedlot because one of his cows is in our freezer. Boy, it's good. If you're an animal lover, I'll say it again. Boy, it's good. <laughs> there is a reason why we're here. In fact, I want to call what we're going to talk about until the cows come home. Okay, a walk on the wild side. And the only wilder this could get is if I actually got inside the corral <laughs> with these fine steaks and uh, did life with them until the cows come home. You know what that means, right? Uh, you can do whatever you want until the cows come home. There will come a time of reckoning when the cows finally make their way. It takes some time. You can have a junk marriage until the cows come home, but the cows are going to come home at some point and there will be a reckoning for living a junk marriage. And what I want to encourage you today right off the bat is to know that if you've been a part 
of a junk marriage. You don't have to remain in that. And when I say that, I'm not saying get a divorce. You're going to see God hates divorce. I'm going to say our junk marriages can be transformed from conventional, cultural, convenient marriages to covenant marriages. So when Jesus spoke his perspective on marriage, he started with, this is kind of junk marriage. It's been uh, changed into something we never had in mind. It was not that way from the beginning, Jesus said. His perspective on marriage is absolutely, 100%, unequivocally, covenant marriage. So we need to talk about that perspective and understand that's actually the only marriage that God ever had in mind for any of us. What he's talking about is that covenants are cut. What does it mean to cut a covenant, we must ask. But first of all, you may be asking, where do you get this idea that marriage is a covenant, you know? Because I don't hear that in our world. Of course you don't, because it was God's idea. I take you to the prophet Malachi, chapter 2, verse 14. The Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. There you go. The reference is to a relationship that is special because it's covenantal, not junk because it's cultural. Okay? The wife of your youth, you entered into it as a marriage covenant. Now, what's he referring to? I told you the kind of the trademarks of a conventional, cultural, convenient marriage, a junk marriage. What are the trademarks of a covenant marriage? Very different. One is, it's initiated for the benefit of one's spouse. You enter into it not to become happy, but to make your spouse happy. To bring pleasure to her, to him, to make their life better. Number two, it requires unconditional promises. This is not dating on steroids. It is promises that cannot, will not be broken. We call those vows. Number three, Based on steadfast love, the Bible word for that, the Hebrew word is chesed, means loving kindness. So the Greek version of chesed in the Old Testament, the Greek version in the New Testament is agape. You've heard of that. An unconditional, uncompromising, unselfish love. Okay, It's done for others. You keep that promise. It's loving kindness. The fourth way you'll recognize it is that these are commitments, not just promises, but now commitments, that are permanent. And then finally, they require confrontation and forgiveness as God does with us. Part of a covenant relationship, a marriage, is that there'll be times where we must confront attitudes, we must confront behaviors, and add to that forgiveness. See, it's that that makes it different than the conventional cultural junk marriage. Those are some of the qualities that Jesus is referring to when he says, it was not this way, the way it's become, in the beginning. Let's get back to the beginning. Let's go back to where we started to understand what God has in mind for those who follow him. Only people in his community, only people of the kingdom will care about this kind of marriage. I'm hoping and praying that if you've not understood it, today you understand it, and this is what you continue to do or transition into. I don't want to assume that you know where this all started, so we go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just right for him. We've mentioned this. He's talking about Eve. And the word helper is not a servant, a slave, a menial object, as our culture would treat people. The word helper is the same word that's used of his role with us that we can't live without him. You won't be able to live without her, Adam. And then he goes on to verse 21. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and he brought her to the man. At last the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She'll be called woman because she was taken from man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. There is no shame in the marriage that God ordained. Okay, she is unlike any other being that Adam has seen. She too now is the image bearer of God. Okay, so that's why Satan, the enemy, 
hates us, every one of us. You know, if you think he's on your side, he's not. He hates us because we are the image bearers of God. We bear his image. These cows, as scrumptious as they are, do not bear the image of God. And it's going to become very obvious here in just a little bit. Okay? What other animal, plant, you know, earthly feature you have fallen in love with, fine. So we are different from the cows. Okay, we're not all equal. They do not bear the image of God. Whatever dog, cat, animal, pet you love, great. Love them. They are not human. These are not human. Only humans. Adam and Eve were the image bearers. That's why Adam said, oh, she is different than all the other creation that I see. Okay. And then he says the two will become one. That word, word one is very special. It means intimate. Intimate. It is a picture of intimacy. And I just want to tell you flat out that everything in your marriage, everything in my marriage, comes down to this one fact. If you want to get some counseling, some marriage counseling free right now, here it is. We were designed for intimacy, but the enemy wants isolation. God's idea was intimacy, oneness. The enemy comes in and says, I will isolate you from one another. And everything we say, everything we do, every rolling of the eyes, every folding of the arms, everything. Can you see can you see me? <laughs> You're out there somewhere. <laughs> Seriously, I'm going to take a shower. <laughs> Everything we do will either take us towards intimacy or help us drift into isolation. Intimacy is of God. Isolation is of the evil one. It is isolation then that we eventually... Isolation is a harbinger of terrible things to come if we don't intercede there, if we don't stop that pattern. They became one. We were meant to be one. One emotionally, one socially, one physically, and one spiritually. Oneness. A team. Okay. That's what it all comes down to. Everything in your life, if, if there are struggles and challenges, they are probably trying to divide you and lead you into isolation. Activities, even children. Get rid of the children. Just kidding. Don't get rid of the children. Quit putting them between you and isolating one another because you have children between you. They're welcome members of the family, but they are not to interrupt the intimacy, the oneness of a man and a woman. And it is a beautiful thing. Covenant marriage is the real deal. It's the authentic thing. And it is a beautiful thing. Unlike the tragedy of junk marriage that we see all around us inside the church and out. So I mentioned that when it comes to covenant, there is the cutting of a covenant. That's, that's kind of the reference in scripture, the cutting of a covenant. What does that mean? Kay Arthur, in her excellent book, Our Covenant God, puts it this way. When two people enter into covenant, neither belongs to himself any longer because those who enter into covenant take on an obligation to their covenant partner. In covenant, two become one and they make an obligation that literally would require their lives if they broke it. This was often referred to as a walk into death because the partners walked through the pieces of the flesh. What is she talking about? That's crazy. Okay, the Hebrew word for covenant is Brit, and Brit means to cut. It was understood from ancient times to cut a covenant meant that at some point flesh was cut and blood poured out. Okay, might remind you of circumcision. Not that you can remember that if you're a guy, but that's the concept. That was the sign of covenant for the Jewish people, right? Circumcision. Again, I think a mood ring or something else would have been better, but that's what God chose. And so to enter into a Brit, a covenant, was to enter into the cutting, the official commitment. And what was it? God made a commitment, a covenant with Abram. And the commitment was, I will give you a land, some property, a place. And Abram was excited, but he kind of wondered, how is this really going to play itself out? You know, and he really was unfamiliar with the idea of what God was talking about. So we pick it up in Genesis 15, verse 8. 
But Abram replied, O oh, sovereign Lord, how can I be sure that I actually possess it, that land? When I get there, you say, this is yours. Are you going to give me a deed? How, how do people know that's my land? The Lord told him, bring me a three-year-old heifer. I don't know how many of these are three years old. But bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So Abram presented all these to him and killed them. Then he cut each animal down the middle and laid the halves side by side. You may love these cows. They're all going to die on purpose. They have a higher purpose than us enjoying them. So for God and Abram, what covenant would include, and it would be the beginning point of covenant, was the cutting of these animals, specifically a cow, putting the two halves aside and passing through those halves, getting the blood on their feet, if they're men. And we're going to see this played out. Verse 12. As the sun was going down, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a terrifying darkness came down over him. Then the Lord said to Abram, and now he makes his covenant with him, tells him what he's going to do for him. And then in verse 17, after the sun went down and darkness fell, Abram saw a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the halves of the carcasses. So the Lord made a covenant with Abram that day. How did he make the covenant? How did he seal it? How did he say, it's enacted now? God is often referred to his presence as a light, right? We know that from John chapter 1. A torch, and that torch passed through the halves of the carcasses. Passed through the halves of the heifer. And from that point on, a covenant was cut. That's what that means. Covenant is synonymous with Brit. Cutting a covenant is what we're talking about. That's why at a wedding, most often, every time I can remember, the wife, the future wife with her dad, walks down between the halves. Did you know that? When they leave, the husband, the new husband and wife, lock out between the halves. That's what it means. We have now entered into a covenant. But junk marriages don't know that. In fact, junk marriages, I don't believe, have made that covenant. They've entered into a very cultural way of understanding marriage. So remember, cutting a covenant means I'm in this for you. That is so different than our culture, isn't it? Our culture is all about my happiness, my feelings. You know, don't judge me. I'll decide if there's a God. Covenant is a whole different thing. It's genuine. It's exactly what God had in mind. I'm in this for you. And can you imagine if both a husband and a wife for a lifetime said, I'm in this for you. What's in your best interest? How does this practically look? Paul talked about it, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. Verse 32. I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. An unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man has to, why? Because he's in covenant has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman in covenant has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. He right there says, I am reminding you of what a marriage covenant is. You have a man looking out for the needs of a woman and a woman looking out for the needs of a man. And therefore, they don't have to look out for themselves. I can trust my needs will be met. And if they're not, delayed gratification. I believe it will work. See the difference between junk marriages and Jesus marriages, between cultural marriages and covenant marriages. Philosophically, they couldn't be more different. Now, in the last lesson, we talked about Matthew chapter 19 and in verse 10. After Jesus has that exchange with the Pharisees, the disciples chime in, if you remember, and they say this. If this is the situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry. They said, if this is what marriage has come to, and here's where we get to the title of these messages, the riskiest decision of your life. Why is marriage, and I do believe it is, Covenant with God is not the riskiest decision. Yes, you give up your life, but look what you get in return. A God who is always loyal, always faithful, always looking out for your needs, taking care of you for all of eternity. How can that be risky? It's not risky at all. 
but you enter into a covenant with another human being, now we're talking risk. And the situation the disciples are talking about is that is so risky, I don't think anybody should be married, right? <laughs> it is risky. I don't know if you ever thought of marriage as being so risky. Steve, I'm a little offended that you'd call marriage risky. That sounds like something we shouldn't do. Well, like Paul said, you know, what you're going to risk is divided attention. And there's more. Let me ask you, if you're getting ready to get on an airplane and they said, hey, welcome to such and such airlines, we have a 50% chance of landing safely at our destination. Would you stay on that airplane? There's no way you would. Would you? If you were getting on a bus and the bus driver said, hey, I'm glad you're on our bus. Uh, you need to know that half the time I crash and people die. Would you get on that bus? Would you get on that train? Would you get on that boat? Never. You'd say, too risky. And yet, we enter into marriage all the time. At a 50% chance, it will crash and burn. Risky. It is risky, I believe is the riskiest decision of your life. No other decision. You know, you buy a car, doesn't work out, yeah, buy another one. You buy a house, you know, it's a lemon of a house. I guess cars are lemons, but it's a house, it's a money pit. You'll find a way to get rid of it, you know? <laughs> you can move on. Marriage, it's for life, right? There's a 50% chance it'll crash and burn. The question is why? And I've already given you the answer. Why do half of the marriages crash and burn? Because they're junk marriages. Because they're cultural marriages where the focus is falling in love. If you want the real deal, if you want to live out a marriage that honors God, lasts a lifetime, you'll need a covenant marriage where you don't fall in love you commit to love. You commit to an agreement where you look out for the best interest of the other person for the rest of your life. Okay, I wanna tell you one of the telltale signs that a couple are investing in a cultural marriage that is sabotaged from the beginning, and that is all their focus is on the wedding ceremony. That's where all their focus is. I've had this happen so many times. I say, you know, with couples, and I, I really don't do weddings anymore because of this, because it's pretty difficult to find a couple who understands and really wants a covenant marriage. But I would often tell them, this will take at least six sessions before we can commit to doing a ceremony. Nobody wants to do that because they just want the ceremony. In fact, a study out of Emory University uh, showed that the more expensive the wedding ring, the less likely the marriage will last. Can you believe that? You can believe that. If all the focus is on what is seen, what is unseen will begin to bubble underneath the surface and it'll come to the surface eventually and it won't be pleasant. Uh, we know we have some good friends who talked about a wedding they went to in Southern California on the beach and they said it was, you know, by far the most expensive wedding they'd ever been a part of. And, you know, I know the weddings now, I think average $20,000, but some of these weddings are $100,000 in expense. I would tell you the same is true. If that kind of money and time and energy is spent on a ceremony and no time is spent on the marriage, it's a cultural marriage that is really in trouble from the very beginning. So you can see it coming that if somebody doesn't want to prepare for the lifetime covenant they're about to enter into of selflessness, you're probably going to be in a junk marriage. I know this is blunt, but I got this from Karen. You can blame Karen. Remember Karen? <laughs> I'm just cutting through the big story. What you'll understand is that a covenant marriage uh, parallels discipleship. It really does. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer once said in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, it, meaning discipleship, is costly because it costs a man his life. Risky stuff. If you enter into a covenant relationship, a covenant marriage, it will cost you your life. You will put your life on hold so that you can serve another and celebrate another and put her needs, put his needs before your own. Now that's a lasting relationship. Somebody once said that Christianity is not for cowards because when you enter into a blood covenant with Christ, it means you have died to yourself and no coward would ever die to himself. To be in a covenant marriage means you have died to yourself. There aren't many, but the ones that exist are doing it the way God intended 
and it is the authentic real deal. Steve, this is just such a downer. I mean, you're talking about dying and walking in blood and blah, blah, blah. I don't like this. That's why a lot of people don't like the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> because Jesus cuts through the big story of our lives and says, here's reality and here's what I have for you because with that great risk, you got it, comes great reward. There is no reward like oneness for a lifetime. None like it. Psalm 25, 10. All the paths of the Lord are loving kindness and truth to those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. Life and truth is what you are entering into in a marriage covenant. If you're an old geezer like myself, you remember Simon and Garfunkel, uh, the duo that became famous, a great harmonizing between the two of them, Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel. There's a story behind this. I wanna, I'm just gonna tell it quickly. Art Garfunkel, when he was in college, I believe it was an Ivy League school, I don't remember which one it was, doesn't really matter, had a best friend named Sandy. And they did everything together. I mean, they just, you know, loved being together, hung out together, shared their lives together, you know, just good, good buddies. I don't know if you had one of those buddies or uh, one of those girlfriends, you know, when you were in college, but that's the way it was for Art and Sandy. But one day, Sandy, who was gonna become this um, really important financier, Sandy's vision began to blur a bit and it got worse and worse and eventually the bad news came out that he was going blind. Well, at this point, people usually would kind of distance themselves. I don't know what to do with a person who's blind. Hard to know how to help someone who's visually impaired, but Art Garfunkel did not do what most people do. You see, Sandy went home and he pretty much gave up on life. Thought, my life is over, I, I can't see anymore. Art Garfunkel went to his home, knocked on his door and said, you are not gonna quit on life. And the long story short is that Art Garfunkel fashioned his life around Sandy's well-being and Sandy becoming the person that Sandy always wanted to be. So he organized his life around helping Sandy. And it's a great story because Sandy eventually did accomplish the things he wanted to accomplish. I might have gotten his master's and doctorate and uh, became very successful. So later in life when Sandy was at Oxford getting his doctorate, he got a call from his buddy Art who had made all this possible and Art said hey a buddy and I want to do an album but it's gonna cost like four or five hundred dollars we don't have it and do you think Sandy even thought for a second he says I have four hundred dollars in my bank account it's yours gave to him and that is how Simon and Garfunkel began is that a great story the idea that somebody would fashion their life around helping another that was like almost like a covenant that was almost like a David Jonathan covenant kind of thing and it's a great example of what marriage, covenant marriage is supposed to be. That the man fashions his life over helping his wife become who God has for her to become. And she does the same for him. And when that's going on, it is a beautiful thing. High risk, higher reward. But again, I can't minimize the risk. Because if there's no risk, then that means this will be easy. Marriage is not easy, of course. So what is the risk? Number one, Covenant breaking. What if we break the covenant? What happens then when the Brit is now broken? What happens? Jeremiah chapter 34, the prophet speaks to the elders of the nation of Israel. Because you have broken the terms of our covenant, I will cut you apart just as you cut apart the calf when you walk between its halves to psalmize your vows. Verse 20, I will give you to your enemies and they will kill you. Your bodies will be food for the vultures and wild animals. It was a walk into death. Anytime you're doing a walk into death, it's risky. The breaking of a covenant. There's that possibility that people actually do that. Number two, contractual marriages are incredibly risky. We know that they fail most of the time. Number three, combination marriages. What's a combination marriage? It's when someone who's following Christ decides to commit their life in marriage to someone who is not following Jesus. They may be religious, they may be a churchgoer, they may even call themselves a Christian, but they're not a follower of Jesus. And when that happens, we read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are temples of the living God. 
So a combination marriage is when light tries to team up with dark. And Paul writes, why would you do that? You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. Why would you unite yourself, try to become one with darkness, with someone who isn't following Jesus? That's a combination marriage. Never works well. That's very risky. Seldom works out. And number four, big risk of entering into marriage is the continual ripple effect on the generations to come. Back to Malachi chapter 2, verse 15. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? Wasn't it about intimacy? Wasn't it a covenant, the prophet says? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does he want? What does God want? Have you ever thought that? What does he want from us? You may love this answer. You may hate it. The answer from God through the prophet Malachi is, he wants godly children from your union. He wants you to reproduce a love, a passion for God. Godly children, not just polite, not just moral, not just conservative. Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. To divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. Again, in those days, Typically, uh, almost in every case, it was a husband who looked at the woman as an object and said, I can do it with or without you, I'm going to do without you, and brushes her aside. And God warns, I want godly children, they will not happen unless both of you are committed to this thing I instituted called marriage. So, what's the point? As it was with murder and really the conversations about anger, the whole point was Jesus was saying, my creation, humanity, is precious. And if you live a life of anger, you're going to harm my creation, the preciousness of others. And guess what? He's saying the same thing. The Pharisees of Jesus' day, the Jewish leaders over the history of Israel, had treated women as objects not as precious children of God. And you can see in the ministry and life of Jesus how he turned that around, how he flipped the tables. He always treated women as precious children of God. And so in our day and age, it's not just women, it's men. All humanity is to be treated as precious children of God. And to lust is to treat as an object. To desire something other than what God has given you is to treat that as an object. You see, that's the real point. The certificate of divorce that they so loved was really just an avenue to treat people as objects, to treat them as though they had no worth. I want you to, again to go back in your time together and read this Matthew 5 passage and now see it differently. It's not just, you know, you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. It's much deeper than that. It is you now as kingdom people, followers of mine, will learn how to love others in a way that the world does not get, does not understand, and is not able. Because you see all humanity as precious. Because all humanity is made in my image. So what can we learn? Lesson number one, actually adultery is not just a physical act. It is um, a heart issue, as Jesus said. So we gotta get back What's wrong with my heart that I would desire, that I think I deserve something beyond what God has given me? I need to appreciate what he's given me. I've got a heart issue that needs to be dealt with. Number two, the preciousness of others is so valuable and essential to life in the kingdom that I must be willing to take extreme measures in order to exercise what Jesus has called me to. It's true in my marriage. It's true in your marriage, and if you ever do get married, that's what you're looking for, all right? Forget tall, dark, and handsome. Forget rich. You're looking for someone who gets this idea, someone who wants to have a covenant marriage, not a conventional, cultural, convenient marriage. So now when you think of marriage, I want you to think of these cows. <laughs> somehow our grandsons, we were eating lunch one day, somehow they started saying their, their word for Christy is Mimi, and one of them, I'm sure it was Keaton, said, Mimi's a cow. And he didn't mean it mean, you know, he's four years old. But I immediately realized, I gotta stop this now. <laughs> and so I said, no, Mimi's not a cow, Mimi's the queen. 
And Colton, the younger one, said, no, Mimi's a cow. I said, no, Mimi's not a cow. Mimi's a queen. <laughs> so eventually, it took a little time, but eventually they got it. And just recently, that was weeks ago, just recently, they both said, Mimi, you're the queen. There you go. <laughs> Mimi's the queen. In case you forgot, and it's easy to forget what we've talked about in these two lessons, let me end with kind of a parable, because parables are easier to understand. They stick with you. Jesus knew that. I read to you from John Orberg's book, Love Beyond Reason. I'm going to read it verbatim, because it is a great parable of what we have been listening to from the lips of Jesus. Her name was Pandy. She had lost a good deal of her hair. One of her arms was missing, and generally speaking, she'd had the stuffing knocked out of her. She was my sister Barbie's favorite doll. She hadn't always looked like this. She had been a personally selected Christmas gift by a cherished aunt who had traveled to a great department store in faraway Chicago to find her. Her face and hands were made of some kind of rubber or plastic so that they looked real, but her body was stuffed with rags to feel soft and squeezable like a real baby. When my aunt looked into the display window at Marshall Fields and found Pandy, she knew she had found something very good. When Pandy was young and a looker, Barbie loved her. She loved her with a love that was too strong for Pandy's own good. When Barbie went to bed at night, Pandy lay next to her. When Barbie had lunch, Pandy ate beside her at the table. When Barbie could get away with it, Pandy took a bath with her. Barbie's love for that doll was, from Pandy's point of view, pretty nearly a fatal attraction. <laughs> By the time I knew Pandy, she was not a particularly attractive doll. In fact, to tell the truth, she was a mess. She was no longer a valuable doll. I'm not sure we could have given her away. But for some reason that no one could ever quite figure out, in the way that kids sometimes do, my sister Barbie loved that little rag doll still. She loved her as strongly in the days of Pandy's raggedness as she ever had in her days of great beauty. Other dolls came and went. Pandy was family. Love Barbie, love her rag doll, it was a package deal. Once we took a vacation from our home in Rockford, Illinois to Canada. We had returned almost all the way home when we realized at the Illinois border that Pandy had not come back with us. She had remained behind in the hotel in Canada. No other option was thinkable. My father turned the car around and we drove from Illinois all the way back to Canada. We were a devoted family. Not a particularly bright family, but a devoted family. We rushed into the hotel and checked with the desk clerk in the lobby. No Pandy. We ran back to our room. No Pandy. We ran downstairs and found the laundry room. Pandy was there, wrapped up in the sheets, about to be washed to death. The measure of my sister's love for that doll was that she would travel all the way to a distant country to save her. The years passed by and my sister grew up. She outgrew Pandy. She traded her in for a boyfriend named Andy, who oddly enough was even less attractive than the doll Pandy. <laughs> Pandy had not been much of a bargain for a long time, and by now the only logical thing left to do was to toss her out, but this my mother could not bring herself to do. She held Pandy one last time, wrapped her with exquisite care in some tissue, placed her in a box, and stored her in the attic for 20 years. The nature of my sister's love is what made Pandy so valuable. Barbie loved that little doll with the kind of love that made the doll precious to anyone who loved Barbie. All those tears and hugs and secrets got mixed in with the rags somehow. If you love Barbie, you just naturally love Pandy too. More years passed. My sister got married, not to Andy, and moved far away. She had three children, the last of whom was a little girl named Courtney, who soon reached the age where she wanted a doll. No other option was thinkable. Barbie went back to Rockford. Back to the attic, dragged out the box. By this time, though, Pandy was more ragged than doll. So my sister took her to a doll hospital in California. Yes, there really are such places. And had her go through reconstructive surgery. Pandy was given a facelift or liposuction or whatever it is they do for dolls until after 30 years, Pandy became once again as beautiful on the outside as she had always been in the eyes of the one who loved her. I'm not sure she looked any better to Barbie but now it was possible for others to view what Barbie had always seen in her. When Pandy was young, Barbie loved her. She celebrated her beauty. When Pandy was old and ragged, Barbie loved her still. Now she did not simply love Pandy because Pandy was beautiful. She loved her with a kind of love that made Pandy beautiful. There are two truths 
about human beings that matter deeply. Number one, we are all rag dolls, flawed and wounded, broken and bent. Number two, though, we are God's rag dolls. He knows us and knows all about our raggedness, and he loves us anyway. There is such a love, a love that creates value in what is loved. There is a love that turns rag dolls into priceless treasures. This is what Matthew 5, 27 through 32 is about. It's another way of saying what Jesus is saying. You heard it said, but I tell you, love me, love my rag dolls. And so covenant marriage is actually not one of two marriages. It is the only marriage that God recognizes. A marriage of selflessness, otherness, and treasuring the priceless preciousness of one of God's rag dolls. It's who we are. It's what we do. It's what he does. Aren't we lucky? Thanks for joining us.